I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. Irrespective of any technological advances, connection to physical place will always be one of the most powerful drivers of meaning, memory and happiness. I hope you enjoy this special episode where five of my guests talk about what the places they chose mean to them. Tarin Brunfit is the irrepressible founder of the worldwide body image movement. The story behind her place choice is a moving insight into addiction and family tragedy. I feel moved even thinking about it, so thank you for for sharing the story you're about to say. It's a park bench in Sydney in Belmont Park. Could you... uh, uh, a, describe the bench and where it is, but also why you've chosen it and the story behind it, Taryn. Mm, um, so this particular park um, opposite Central Train Station in Sydney was where my brother passed away. And every time I go to Sydney, I, you know, for work and for meetings, I always make sure I take the time to go and sit on that bench. And it's a real, it's really odd to sit somewhere that, someone that you love and desperately miss, that was the last place he took his breath, you know, like his final breath was taken on that bench. And uh, my brother and I were incredibly close as kids. We spent um, every weekend um, collecting lizards and we even got a brown snake in a jar once, which my mum almost killed us for, and <laughs> um, tadpoling and, you know, getting frogs. And you know, we just, yeah, we were so, so close. And um, sadly, um, in his teenage years, he um, he was a bit wild too, but probably didn't know where to put the limits on, you know, his exploration of, say, drugs. Um, And he tried heroin and, um, you know, he, just like I do as well, and other members of my family, incredibly addictive personalities. And that was it for him. He... He was a heroin addict for, oh gosh, six or seven years. And, um, and yeah, he got off the train in Sydney. He was going for a job and we'd spoken to him only a few days before. And it felt like for anyone who's listening, who, who, who's experienced a relationship with an addict, you go through the ringer in terms of the hope and we're turning a corner and here we go. But this last time that Jason had said, I'm going for this job, it's in Sydney, we all felt that he was turning a corner. How old was he? 27. 27. Yeah, and we we suspect that he needed to take a hit just to get that confidence to... To, to go to that job interview and obviously it was, it was a bad dose of heroin and, um, yeah, he died. And when I sit on that bench, sometimes I just, sometimes I sit there and eat. Sometimes I just sort of stare blankly. Um, sometimes I cry. Sometimes I think, like, watching everyone walk past, like, I feel like saying, I feel like saying, telling the story, like, mm. you know, 
um, you know, this is significant and this is what happened and I don't know what where that comes from but um, I think just watching everyone go about their lives and you're sitting there in such trauma, I guess that happens to human beings every single day of their lives, right? People are always going through something and we just don't know. Um, but, yeah, gosh, that bench. Um, and how, have you got any other brothers and sisters? Or was I have a sister, yeah. So Jason was four years older than me and Justine's seven years older than me. And... and, and- uh, were you all wild? You, I'm thinking of the poor old m- my mum and dad. You go, God, I, I need to meet them and, and give them a hug. So. No, and my, everyone loves my mum and dad. They're such beautiful people. And my sister, total square bear. <laughs> God, total square bear. Um, and still is to this day. So, yeah. I mean, do you know what, though? I mean, I was, I was a little bit wild f- for a little while there, but I was also, I did sort of toe the line and, and do the right thing. Um, Jason was, you know, that's another level. Really. Were, were you a druggie? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I tried different, you know, you experiment, um, but certainly not. No. Yeah. And, and do you think looking back, you know, I, I, I was talking to you about the, 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 the out of the forest guy that we spoke to on a different episode where, where people are amazing how things can happen and life takes you in different ways. Is, is Do you think anything could have been done differently that may have resulted in a different outcome on that bench or was it just destined that Jason was on a trajectory? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this thought goes through your head, you know, a thousand times. What could have we, what more could we have done? I certainly know that my mum and dad couldn't have done any more. No. I mean, they found Jason on the streets in Melbourne when he was living there. He went missing for a few days and he was homeless. He was living on the streets. You know, they, they drove their car around endlessly to try and find him. And when they did find him, you know, he he was homeless. He was mm. dirty. He smelt. His hair was gross, you know. And as I've mentioned, you know, mum and dad are really good people with really solid values and yeah, what I mean, how that would have broken their hearts. I think, um, you know, that breaks my heart when I think of mum and dad and how they've coped with all this and then getting that knock on the door, you mm. know, from I, I was in New Zealand at the time when I learnt of my brother's passing and even though you know there's risk, obviously, with, uh, you know, having a sibling with a, with a drug abuse uh, it problem, you never actually expect that you're going to hear those words. And my sister rang up and said, Jason's dead. And I just, you know, I dropped to my knees. I was at work, unfortunately. So, yeah, it was really tough. The, the, <laughs> to keep it lighter, though, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about um, when Jason's belongings came home um, to us as a family, he had a backpack and mum, dad, Justine and I sat around in the lounge room and went through his belongings and, um, you know, there was a book and there was a little packet of red frogs. Um, <laughs> so now whenever my kids see red frogs, they go, mum, mum, there's red frogs and we always buy them and eat oh, them and remember right. Jason. And, um, but um, in the backpack, um, there was also um, dad, there was a piece of paper and dad started reading out names on this piece of paper and it was women's names and about four names in, the penny dropped for me. I'm like, oh my God, dad's reading out Jason's sex list. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he's sat on a train somewhere and gone, <laughs> who are all the women I've slept <laughs> with in my life? And let me tell you, the list was long. <laughs> but the, but the crack, I mean, if you met Jason, you would love him. The most charismatic, funny, delightful, warm, beautiful person you would ever meet. People love Jason. It was Sean Penn's stunt double, or was that, that right? Yeah. And, and, and again, this is classic Jason, always at the right place at the right time in terms if you know, yeah. he was mine, doing some mining job um, up in Mount Isa and they were filming the Thin Red Line and n- next minute they needed someone to, yeah, play Sean Penn's movie double. Right. And, he's, <laughs> you know, he's on the set of the Thin Red Line, you know, with all John Travolta and except, uh, I mean, Adding names to his list. Yeah, well, <laughs> correct, Nigel. That's exactly right, living the movie life. But when Dad kept reading the list, the funniest thing was and the most awkward moment was... On the list, it had psychologist. Right. But then it had psychologist's daughter. Oh, like, <sighs> oh my God. Did, did it have like, psychologist's mum as well? Did he have the <laughs> trifecta? <laughs> and I think that sort of sums up my brother. That's kind of, that's a legendary move, that one, to not only have sex with a psychologist, but the daughter as well. <laughs> uh, oh, I love it. <laughs> Le 
Elaine Beachley won the World Surfing Championship a remarkable seven times. Her choice of place speaks to our need for belonging, rejuvenation and self-care and the magical but fragile powers of the ocean. Now, now most people, when I ask them to choose a place, choose a specific geographical place, but you've gone next level. And you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you won't follow a brief woman. Are you surprised? You, you've gone the ocean. <laughs> yes. So tell me about that. The ocean is my place of solace. It's the one place in the whole universe where I feel f- a sense of freedom. I feel truly relaxed and the most burning desire in every human being, I feel a sense of belonging. I don't feel like I belong anywhere else other than in the ocean. And, and is it equally good whether it's Fistral Beach or Manly Beach? As long or, as it's salt. As long as it's salt. Okay, interesting. Is it, is that, how wonderful, because there is a lot of it on this planet. I'm <laughs> very fortunate. You can access it. <laughs> and it's warming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so have you ever lived mm. away from it? No, I have not, ever. If anything, I've just committed my life to living as close to it as I possibly can. And one of the best pieces of advice I received when I started earning decent money was invest in real estate that you could ultimately live in yourself. Mm -hmm. So every piece of real estate I ever bought had ocean views. Right, okay. (laughs) Um, And then I went to London for the Olympic Games in 2012 as an athlete liaison officer for the Australian Olympic team and spent six or seven weeks around London and I immersed myself into the Olympic Games. I had an access to hilarious passes if I'm not going to abuse them. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So I did. And I had an absolute ball, but once again, immersing myself and giving too much of myself, I left there completely exhausted. My sister was working in London at the time, so I grabbed her and she and I went to Barcelona for a holiday. Mm-hmm. And the minute I got there, I dove in the ocean and I cried ah. because I, I didn't realise how much I'd missed, missed it, right. being, f- feeling like I'm nurtured. Sure. I feel so. I feel like I go back into the womb. Right. Like it's my embryonic fluid when I'm in the ocean. I feel that sense of joy and freedom and happiness and centeredness and connectedness and just... Oh. <laughs> That's how I feel every time I'm in the water. Do you fear for it? Do I fear for it? Fear for the ocean. I do fear for the ocean. Well, I fear for our lives because we will not survive without the survival of our oceans mm. and our coral. You know, I, I, that produces our mm. oxygen. It's the plankton that produces our oxygen. So, yeah, I fear for the ocean. I saw a film recently, which I wish I hadn't, and it was, was about plastic in the ocean. Which one was that? Uh, I forget what it's called. It's a documentary, and yeah. the thing that that stuck with me, which I, I can't get out of my head, is uh, my amateur thinking is okay. If there's all this crap in the ocean, where well, we can scoop it out one day, right? <laughs> one day. W- w- what the film showed was that the plastic breaks down into micro beads yeah. so it's like a soupy mess in yeah. which you can't so it's not like i think oh okay, well, i'll go and pick the plastic bag up no no no, no. it's broken down it will be there for 600 years at least and you go oh my word yeah we're suffocating our planet yeah yeah just through plastic my own dentist didn't realize there was microplastics in toothpaste All right he's like why do you use herbal toothpaste because like, there's no microplastics in them he's like what's a microplastic Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> so I've, got, I've got a confession for you. So, yes. so I do something. My, my children laugh at me. I, I actually make them do it as well, so they avoid me. It, it's, it's a thing called Take Three. I'll Take Three for the sea. I, I do it every day. I love it. Oh, it's good so on easy. You. And, and, and do you know what? I get a real, and if I. If Why I, do I, your children laugh at it, you? Well, because dad's a sado. So it, it, even if, if I can only get two, mm. I go looking for the <laughs> third. <laughs> I go, where are you going? I go, hold on, I haven't got my third. Well, the, bit thing, of plastic. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that when you're walking along the beaches, on the northern beaches that it's not that hard to find right. three. I actually commit myself to finding a dozen. Right. You know, I, I literally commit myself to picking up everything I walk past because right. what you walk past you allow. You set the standards by your own behaviour. Do, do you know Little Marley Beach in the National Park? Mm. So I went this beautiful place mm. and I was really upset because the most beautiful place you've got to walk there yeah. and then there's all this shit on the beach yeah, it's I, was, it's all like, I wish I'd brought a bin liner yeah. so I'm putting yeah. other people's in your plastic in my pa- yeah. Yeah, yeah. so when I find plastic in the water and I'm in a bikini I can't hold it so I paddle up to a mate with broad right. shorts and ask yeah. if he's got a pocket and just oh. But but here we go. I'm a long range optimist. Yes, we're going to sort this shit out. We we're going to sort, sort it out somehow. Out. But you know what? It's not just the plastic that we've got a concern no. with. It's mm. all of our behaviours, and we're just we're too apathetic. We're just waiting for someone else to do it because we don't think we can make any difference. But every one of us can make a difference by just choosing to not buy single use plastics, reject the use of straws. The number one, I think, the number one culprit for marine and beach pollution in when it regards to plastic are those little sushi 
fish caps. Mm. Those little red caps, oh. I pick up one every single yeah. day. And just making different choices and thinking ahead. And mm. that's all it takes. And people think it, you know, it has to change the world to be important. But actually just by changing your thought patterns and changing your choices changes the world. And then it does make I'm it I'm so glad you do. I, I'm, I'm going to no longer feel embarrassed about it. I'm going to no. proudly do Tell your three. kids, Lane does it. And if they don't, that's then it. Okay, I'm, so I'm going to I'll- come around and belt them. The wonderful Rosie Waterland is a writer, podcaster and performer. Her place story is a shocking yet heartwarming tale of a dysfunctional upbringing. For your um, fourth choice, uh, the place, you have chosen the Blue Mountains. Yeah. Now, that, now that's, quite, um, that's quite a large place. I know. So can when, you get more specific? Well, or is yeah, because when I listened to some other episodes, people chose specific addresses. Yes, and yeah. I'd already sent in my choices. So I thought, uh-oh. But Elaine but, Beachley chose the ocean. Well, yeah, Which, is, which is bigger than the Blue Mountains. Um, well, yeah, I suppose I can give you an address. Queens Road, Lawson. What happened there? That was our house. Right. Um, so my mum, my sisters and I got out of foster care and while we were in foster care, she had met a man um, who she started dating and he had inherited a house, which was that house in the Blue Mountains. And so we got out of foster care and immediately moved up to this just very foreign place to us because we'd always grown up sort of in and around Sydney and... Um, And we were with this man and in a house that we owned, which we had gone from like housing commission and places, you know, called the ghetto, nicknamed the ghetto. Um, And then we went up to this beautiful house just in this beautiful kind of bushy area that was at this perfect place sort of halfway up the mountain that on a clear day you could actually see the city. Like that's how beautiful the view was from this place. I'm sure the house is worth like a shitload of money now. And so we lived in that house on and off for four years, which is why I picked it uh, or the Blue Mountains as a place because even though with my mum's drinking we would get sent away and come back and sent away and come back, that was still our base for four years, which is the longest at that point we had ever lived in one place. It was the longest I ever went to one school. Like I went to more than 20 schools and the only high school friends I still have today are the friends from that four-year period of time. Have you ever been back to the house? Um, Yeah, my sister and I drove past it. We took her kids um, and went on a road trip up to Katoomba one day, which is weird because when you live in the Blue Mountains, it's not a tourist destination to you. Like after school, we used to just hang out at the Coles near Katoomba Station and, you know, you'd go get a pie in Lura and we used to shoplift at that famous lolly shop. Like, (laughs) because we, you know, we just lived there. Um, But we took the kids up there and so we took them to the Three Sisters and stuff and then on the way back, we stopped in at the house and um, it's different now because the area has become very developed. So it used to be about one house every few hundred metres just and bush in between and now it just kind of looks like one of those home villages like it's completely full in a way that it wasn't back then Um, but the house itself is still the same and I've always said one day if one of my books takes off and I become a bazillionaire that's the first house I'd want to buy and would you to buy to live in or to or to demolish? No, to live in. Right, okay. I loved it. I mean, there's some traumatic memories there because with my childhood, for every good memory, there's like five bad ones. But it's the only place I ever lived long enough as a kid to have some sense of home, f- home or familiarity. And I never had that anywhere else. And I haven't really had it until now that I've been old enough to support myself. And I've lived in one house for like five years now um, that I rent. But like, that's why one of my biggest dreams is just to buy a house or it's Sydney. So maybe a very small apartment. I just want to buy a place that I never have to move out of ever. So we are living parallel lives because every place I've ever lived in, I'm I'm a military kid. So we moved around every three years. Um, And every place I've ever lived in, I've said to my wife, this is it. Yeah. Right, and, and and currently I'd say that you go. I, I'd be happy <laughs> yeah. to be moved out of my house in a box. I've got no desire, no aspirations, nothing. Mm. It's it's lovely, it's perfect. And one of the things in the house is you know those height charts. 
for yeah. the kiddies, right? So we've been there 12 years, uh, and, and my kids, you know, my youngest ones are 18, so it's got all the kids and all oh. their friends. So if, I mean, and I mean this seriously, Rosie, is if I had to move, which I'm never going to, mm. I would take that bit of the wall with me. Yeah. I, I would ask somebody, what do you do? Do you scan it? Do you, oh, can I actually rip it out of the house or whatever? You go, it, it, it's so important yeah. to me. You go, it represents everyone I love yeah. you know, on, on the wall. And you've been in this one place. Yeah. I'll never move, Nigel. And, well, I don't, I don't want to. That's the dream. <laughs> I would stay in one place forever if I could. And I think that's why I never had a huge interest in travelling either. I haven't really done that. I've traveled a little bit for work, but other than that, I've never been hugely invested. I've always thought I would rather spend my money in just living in one place right. <laughs> than having to go other. I don't I just want to live in one place and just Be happy. sit on the couch and not have any drama. Yeah, peace of mind. <laughs> Monica McInerney is an internationally best-selling author. The love for her rural hometown Clare is clear in this evocative description of an idyllic childhood from a unique bygone era. Yeah, I grew up in the Clare Valley and I feel very lucky in so many ways, as I mentioned earlier, to have grown up in this big, uh, lively, noisy, talkative, argumentative, action-packed family. But I'm also very lucky to have grown up in a physically beautiful place um, because, as I mentioned, I think that I nature photography is what I love and I know that's taking me back to, as a kid, being surrounded by the countryside. And my dad was a station master, so we grew up in the station master's house, which was this big, gorgeous house just next to the station. Uh, so we could be railway kids, like we used to play on the railway tracks. We would run, you know, do our own Olympic Games and one of the events was, you know, the 100-metre balance on the railway lines. Um, there was a stockyard nearby because the, the trains would bring sheep and, and, um, and cattle and the stock market, the stock market was just up near us. So we would jump over the fences and that was our hurdles and our Olympics. But we could also, um, just go to this, the town. Like, so we were a five minute walk down to the main street. So we could be town, country town kids. But across the road from our house was the Clare Hills. So gum trees and, and all the undergrowth of Australian bush, basically. And we, we had, we found an old quarry up there. We, there were creeks that sometimes had water in them. Um, there were spiders and possums and, you know, snakes and all of that and we could move very easily between um between those those lives we also grew up in this fantastic house um that was a big rambling house and when mum and dad moved there they had no kids and then then they had all seven of us and we kind of joked that we're lucky it was so big or it might be short a couple of brothers and sisters um but also it's the it's a wine growing area it's beautiful riesling and um and beautiful reds and um my you know a couple of my brothers worked in the wine industry for a while I, we couldn't see vineyards from where our house was, but there was a, a winery just down the road. So I grew up to the sound of the, the clanking of the machine, the tractors bringing the grapes, the smell of a winery town during vintage. We grape picked. My first job was as a grape picker, paying you know ten cents a bucket, which quite frankly is a rip off. Um, it's slave labour, and uh, so to grow up in a in a place where your surroundings, like an agricultural area, um, even though you know my, I said my dad was a station master, not a winemaker or a farmer, but I'm a country kid to my bones and I still love being back in Clare. Um, I, I, every one of my books I launch at the Clare Town Hall where as a kid I used to perform in the musicals and, you know, and then, then there's me, now I'm there. And, you know, recently like, um, Penguin, my publishers are fantastic. I, they, they get us lovely drivers to take us places. And it, it was like a scene from a film, like the, the this beautiful car pulls up in front of the Clare Town Hall and the driver hops out and opens the door for me to step <laughs> out <laughs> to do a talk in the town hall, you know, my hometown and it just amused me so much because of course the first people I saw as soon as I step out is really old family friends of ours the Smiths actually who I <laughs> named my the Smith family go to Perth on the train after and they were laughing says look at you getting out of the fancy car <laughs> and I said yeah look you know only for another week then I go back to being me um, and it's just a special it's a beautiful place I really recommend anybody to to go to the Clare Valley it's a uh, it's a series of lots of little like villages and towns 
full of wineries. Um, the railway line that my dad used to mind as the station master, it got burnt in the uh, 1980s bushfires and that hastened the end of the railways very sadly. Um, and it was, you know, my dad was a railway man to his bones from the age of 14 and it was heartbreaking for him that it, it ended. But the railway line uh, is now the Riesling Trail that runs through the whole valley and it's a walking and cycling path. And when I was there you know, last week, I went for a long walk on my own and gum tree and the galahs and the lorikeets and the magpies and uh, and you, you can just lose yourself. It's so peaceful. Um, and the, like, loads of the little wineries have cafes attached and restaurants and you can stay in old, you know, settlers' cottages. Uh, yeah, and I, I've set three, four, five of my novels have Clear Valley settings. So uh, It's wonderful hearing you talking about it. <laughs> but, but reading about your childhood in research for this conversation, um, I... I couldn't help but think about your book choice that was describing sort of society in New York, a, a world that, you know, for all its faults, uh, you know, was a world that was distinct, but that has now gone. And, and when, when I look in at your childhood, the sort of the Von Trapp children, the, the, the McInerneys, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the hilarious story of your wheels are turning <laughs> when you're sh- shouting at abuse at cyclists, but it just seems so idyllic and innocent and wonderful and, and although the Clare Valley now is a gorgeous fabulous place to, to, to visit it, it's sort of I don't think people are going to have your childhood again they probably aren't going to have the library books delivered on the train and the Christmas Santa and all the wonderful so I, I just was reminded of the age of innocence because your childhood just sounded so so delightful I'm, I'm sure it had its problems but Gosh, yeah, I had thought of that. That it, it is actually it's a perfect title for that. And um, and I yeah, as I said, I love childhood. I didn't like adolescence. Um, and of course, my family, like every family in the whole world, has been through um so many you know sorrows and and disappointments and and dangerous times and scary times because we're human beings and that's what happens. But I think that's why I hold that uh, that beautiful childhood with such love and joy to my heart because I do think that's what formed me, you know, that the um – and the constant, the constant arrival of visitors and family and friends and, and, and interestingly in a way that with Edith Wharton with the Age of Innocence where she, she's able to portray so much about human life through the lens of that high society. I learned growing up in a small town um, in lots of ways in the way that Agatha Christie says, you know, that's why she set so many of her books because all life happens in, a, in an English village. In a, it turns out all life happens in a small Australian country town too because we had, you know, we might have only had one immigrant family. We had one Indigenous family. We had, you know, one family that lived in terrible poverty. But growing up in that, you are absolutely exposed to every every factor of of life racism um sexism um ageism um sporting careers more intellectual careers you know having to leave home because there's not jobs in your area and i think sometimes in a way that if i'd grown up as a city kid i wouldn't have seen all that sure. stra- those stratas because and also at that you know that stage where we were going to mass every sunday as kids and so uh you know we would all those conversations that happen after that we were very involved in sport um, the, the musical society, as I said, and just small town life, really. And when mum worked in the local library, you know, dad, the station master. And so I saw, and I was very curious, eavesdropping kind of a child. I'm curious, eavesdropping kind of an adult. And I noticed all of that, really. And, um, and I think I still draw on all of that too, too, in my, in my novels and in my writing that, you know, I saw, great sadnesses and and marriage breakups of friends and and because in a small town it's not like oh we're going to go off to the cinema and and not pay heed to what's going on in the house and also I, I grew up um like you know I really remember lying in bed at night time and hearing mum and dad and their friends talking from the kitchen and the voices coming through and the way that they'd rise and fall uh, they're really political like they'd have these great political and theological arguments and um but also a lot of really great storytelling my dad was really funny and great storyteller my mum's a great storyteller and dialogue writing is my favorite part of my books and I'm sure that's from being, sure. You know, I'd lie there as a kid and I'd, you know, okay, why are they lowering their voices? What's going on? And then you'd hear that roar of laughter and then, you know, a bit argumentative. And I love, it was like this beautiful soundtrack of voices. And, and maybe that would have, you know, maybe that's a country childhood too. So I do, I really feel that I was very lucky. There's a wonderful phrase where kids 
learn most from what they hear from the top of the stairs. Oh, that's very yeah. good. Yeah, no, no, that's very good. Now tell me, um, why didn't you like adolescence? Um, oh, I never felt comfortable in my skin. Like, I don't, does anybody like adolescence? I don't think they do, do they? Brad Pitt. I, Brad, well, maybe, but then I'll look at him now. See, so that didn't end well. <laughs> See? Um, I think I just found it very awkward, really. Um, and um, what, what boys and all that stuff? Or? Yeah, and, and I wasn't a popular, you know, I wasn't popular and... You know, I didn't have a boyfriend when my friends did, and and it, I sort of felt, um, yeah, I wanted it to be over. I wanted to get out in the world. I kind of, sure. as I said, I loved my childhood, but um, and and I did love like Clare High School was great, and again to pay tribute to a great teacher. I had a really good English teacher who, his name was Jim Stokes, and he. He noticed that there was something, he said, I, you know, there's something about your writing, keep at it, you know. And so I, there's lots of very many moments I'm grateful. But even though I'm talking to you, I'm saying I'm kind of squirming, just remembering. Have I you triggered know, like, you? No, just, you know, <laughs> like what do you wear and, and you're so self-conscious about what you look like. And, and I've got, you know, 18 gorgeous nieces and nephews and some of them are coming through adolescence and, I can, and I'm watching them suddenly become self-conscious. Do you know, and that yeah. way that the kids have that gorgeous um, earnestness and, and um, uh, confidence. And then when the hormones come flying in and you see them, you know, they, they suddenly think that they're not good looking enough or, you know, and, and this is, you know, I grew up before social media, you know, God help them uh, with what kids have to do now. Um, so I think it's an awkwardness and I, yeah, I, I, I need to write it out of myself. Like I've written a lot about younger characters, but I think I need to touch on um, just that awkwardness of adolescence because I reckon I'm going to um, hit a few gold seams in my head that I haven't kind of I, I unearthed can't yet. I can't wait to read. <laughs> I cannot wait to read. Now, oh, you'll squirm when you read them because I'm squirming <laughs> just thinking about it. Sarah Wilson is a respected activist and philanthropist. Her chosen place reminds her of the time she discovered, to her surprise, she was the subject of a huge permanent public artwork in Belgium. The place that you've chosen, I used to live in Belgium, bizarrely, for three yeah. years. You chose uh, Dam, 6K uh, away from Bruges. Yes. Which, if you were to ask me uh, before this episode to guess where you were going to choose, I wouldn't have guessed. Lovely though the people are, I wouldn't have guessed down. Could you yes. describe the town and then tell the fabulous story behind why I you've chosen it? I always to tell you why I've chosen it um, to explain why I chose the town. I chose the town for the story because I thought it was yes. a, good, a good story to tell. Um, it, it was it was probably it was a place I stumbled upon. Um, I took off sort of at eighteen and travelled around Europe and. Um, I actually, funnily enough, sitting in a radio station studio as we are, I won a modelling competition which was going to take me to Europe to model. But I got there and I was told to lose just um, like a centimetre off my body over oh, Christmas. Uh, height? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Make yourself shorter, woman. They're entirely unrealistic, but not that yep. unrealistic. Um, so I went up to Yorkshire and visited an old primary school friend and just drank Guinness and put on about 10 kilos. So that was the end of my modelling career. So what am I going to do now? I went and travelled around Europe, just kind of aimlessly, um, and just got work as an au pair and things like that. But... Um, I went to Amsterdam and hired a bike from the railway station and just rode every day. Um, and then I ended up in, I went down to Bruges and I had uh, half a day to kill. So I walked out just along one of the canals and I think about 45 minutes, maybe an hour, maybe a bit more, I can't remember, out to this little village called Dam. And I didn't know what it was. I just arrived. It had a church and a, a museum and that was about it. And I was wandering around and I was, I was quite, I don't know, lonely, you know, um, but sort of checking things out. And this person came up to me and spoke to me in French and said, um, we're making this documentary on this famous um, Flemish artist and um, he's seen you and would like to illustrate your face. And um, this is all in French and I understood a little bit of French from reading a French textbook in a library in London above the pub that I worked in, you see. So that's how I got the job in Corsica as well. Um, so I said, okay, I've got nothing else to do. So this guy came over. He would have been, I think, 
in his 70s, like early 70s. He was just old and he set up an easel and he sketched super, super fast about 20 pictures of my face. And I just sort of sat there and he gave me one of these sketches and signed it. And um, they were doing this documentary and this is pre-internet, of course. And they said, well, would you come back in, I think October it was, where he's going to turn it into this big brass statue that's going to go here and we're going to make the documentary about him making it. And he's, you know, and he's, they said, would you come back? And they gave me an address and a time and said, come back. And of course I didn't. I had other things to do. Um, and, you know, there's no way I could contact them to say, sorry, won't turn up, you know, won't be there. Um, I never thought about it again. And then only a couple of years ago, the story came back to me and I thought, oh, I could probably go on Google Maps and find that town. So I'd forgotten the name of the town. I'd forgotten it all. And so um, I could just make out the name of the artist on his signature. It's quite hard to read. Um, I think it's Charles Duport or Charles Dupont or something like that. I think I told you the name of it anyway. Uh, Delport. Yeah, thank you. And so um, I went on to Google Maps and looked at Bruges and went, I, I've got a really good sense of direction. I went, I know the direction, which canal I walked out on. And I went, it was that one. And so I worked out what 45 minutes would be. And I went, oh, it must be that village. And then I Googled that guy's name and that village. And what do you know? Um, up popped on Google Images a whopping great rusty green bronze statue of my face. I think it's about seven foot high in triplicate. That, that's just such an amazing thing to... A, it's a great story, but amazing thing to happen to you. So, so usually, ooh, I got spotted for being beautiful, so can you be in this shampoo advert or something? Yeah. You got spotted for being looking nice on a park bench in Belgium, and there's a permanent piece of art. Yeah. That, I mean, they, they've got your nose wrong. You've got your nose in the air. But apart from that, <laughs> I think it's quite a nice night. He, ang- he angled my face probably. And remember, I was a lot younger there. But yeah, isn't it strange? Oh, I, I just think it's... But it even gets weirder because I wrote a blog post about it and all pe- people loved the, the intrigue of the story. Yeah. And somebody went, oh, my um, mother is Flemish and she remembers seeing the documentary. Right. Right. So it does exist somewhere. And I... I so did- you'll be on film being sketched? Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, I presume so. But then I was um, at a party um, and these sort of arty Europeans were at this party and there was a person there who was a historian from from Belgium and I went, oh, I've got a story for you. And I told him the story and went, oh, yeah, he's really w- well known and he died. Um, and I went, yeah, I know, he died a couple of years ago. Um, so he... He, he knew the story as well. So, so I've got the sense that you should in some way, like, have, have the sculpture. Uh, it's, it's a shame a... I'm not a materialist, isn't it? Well, indeed. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and Sixty. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20-year follow-on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com. Sometimes during Christmas, something magical happens. Hey, Cricket customers. The Max with Ads plan is included with the Cricket $60 Unlimited plan at no additional cost. And this holiday season, Max is the one to watch when you're feeling festive. Son of a nutcracker! Cozy up to all the holiday classics like Elf, 8 Big Christmas, and the Harry Potter 8 Film Collection. Just log in with your Cricket username and password to experience Max on all your favorite devices. Phone plan streams and standard definition programming subject to change. Fees, terms, and restrictions apply. See CricketWireless.com for details.